Okay, uh, the songs that we sang are just so uh, go along with um, today's message. And I think you'll see that as we go along. And um, I just uh, thank God for the, the truths that are in this music. And it's like, uh, I think it was Charles Wesley who said he who um, sings, uh, worships twice or something like that, or, or preaches twice. I can't remember how, exactly how it went, but uh, you do. You hear the message of God so powerfully, both in your heart and in your ears and in so many different ways. And it engages so many, uh, so, so many of your different senses you know, to listen to beautiful hymns and to sing them out. Yeah, so praise God. Okay, I titled today's uh, message, Salvation Belongs to the Lord. Let's see a sip of water here. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And it sure does. And I, I think that we saw that in, in testimony as well as in our music. And uh, we're going to look together at Jonah chapter 2, verses 7, uh, excuse me, starting with 117 to 210. So the, verse 17 of chapter 1 is the very last verse of that chapter. And, um, and then, of course, chapter 2 is 10 verses long. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I will, excuse me, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. As I've emphasized in the last two weeks, this is a, um, an incredible piece of uh, literary work that uh, is telling the story of a, a, a historical story of a historical prophet. This uh, Jonah was an actual prophet uh, from Galilee, and, um, and he preached at about the time of Jeroboam II's um, kingship in the northern kingdom Israel. This occurred probably around 760 BC. And as we saw in the prior week, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach. So he went in the opposite direction. He was willing to be on a boat for 2,000 miles all the way to what we know as southern Spain, rather than the 500 mile trek up to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. As I emphasized, Assyria was a wicked um, empire and perhaps the most cruel of all the empires that Israel had faced during its time, more so than Egypt and um, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The Assyrian Empire, where they were just re really ruthless and cruel in the way they treated their enemies, their opponents. Um, having emphasized the fact that we're looking at an, an actual historical person who's giving an account of something that had happened in his life. 
very miraculous um, as, as we see here. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can see some uh, significant symbolism here. Um, uh, this makes for great illustration. The book of um, Jonah here makes for great illustration in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. That what we first do whenever we read a book of the Bible is find out what is the author's intent, what is really being communicated, and then, and then we can look also at, well, what, what do we learn from this? Are there types and shadows in this? And there certainly is, because Jesus himself said in Matthew 12, 40, he said, even as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we see there, once again, that Jesus Christ himself saw Jonah as a historical person and um, says that he was really um, foreshadowing Christ. But what did this mean to the Jews at this time? It would have been um, an eye-opening um, experience for them to hear this testimony as to how God actually reached beyond Israel because he is the God of heaven and earth and reached out and touched and had mercy on Gentiles at a time when Israel was very much turned in totally on themselves, seeing themselves as privileged because God had delivered them from Egypt and God had made a covenant with them. But even though they were backsliding and going into idolatry, in a massive way, um, you know, they were still thinking that, well, we're okay, because after all, we've got, we've got God's law, we've got God's command. They, they were synchronizing the, the, the idolatrous re religions of the Canaanites and of the surrounding nations along with their worship of, um, of Yahweh God, and they were worshiping Baal and other gods as well. But they felt that they had a sense of false security because they felt they were a privileged people and they despised the Gentiles and God has a message to the Jewish people through this what's interesting for us now if we want to just see a little bit of symbolism here too in chapter 1 when we see Jonah on the boat on this ship and you see this uh, treacherous storm and these winds and their lives, the lives of all the people on that ship are threatened. Um, it, it almost is, you could look at it as um, a, a symbol of what God's people are supposed to be. If you could look at the ship just for a moment as illustrative of the world and all the Gentile nations as the mariners on the ship and as these mariners are crying out to their deities in desperation because they're they know that there's um, these storms and they're so afraid that they're going to die that they're going to perish at sea they are terrified by what they're seeing and on that boat is this man Jonah who is a prophet who is um, Jewish and it was through the nation of Israel that God wanted to bless all the nations of the world. They were to be the light of the world, a light to the surrounding nations. So in a way, you could look at that ship as symb symbolically as the, as the world and all the people that walk in darkness. And in their desperation, they cry out to their gods. They don't have the knowledge of the true God. But God sovereignly uses Jonah, because Jonah's very reluctant <laughs> to, to have mercy on anybody except himself. And that comes out clearly in this book, especially when you get to chapters 3 and 4. You'll see the, uh, the little bit of the mind and heart of Jonah and his reluctance to, that God would have mercy to proclaim God's mercy to anybody else. And, um, and, but God uses him and um, Jonah makes this tremendous confession of faith in verse 9 of chapter 1 when he said, I am a Hebrew. And I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. That's a huge confession. He is the one God who created everything and is over 
all. He created the heaven and the dry land. You, you might be worshiping the God of the mountains. You might be worshiping the God of the valleys. You might be worshiping the God of the seas. You might be worshiping the God of your individual region that you live in. But let me tell you, Jonah says that, he, that there's one God and he is over all of it. He made this earth. He made the sea. You see all your little deities over everything, but God made it all. And so he therefore is sovereign over all. We don't know altogether what Jonah may have said. This is a very concise um, account of what he experienced. But he may have shared so much more with them that by the end they fear the Lord. All the, the people on this boat fear the Lord and they cry out to him. You know, in our world, wherever, wherever that is, God has called us to be a light. All we have to do is be yielded. That's all. He'll use us to be a light. And um, I think that's important for us to realize. Then in chapter 2, we see that Jonah is now in the belly of the fish. <laughs> Not a good place to be. I was um, reading last night a little bit of John Kelvin's commentary on this chapter, and, and he was uh, remarking about the, in, the incredible miracle that's actually happening here. Three days and three nights. We know it, it was at least, um, some scholars say, may not have been literally a three, three days and three nights, but it was a, a, definitely a full day and at least parts of two other days, which would have encompassed a couple of nights, or it could have literally been three days and three nights. So it's amazing that a fish in the water that would have been taking water in consist constantly, whatever this being is, this, this fish, whatever kind of fish it was, um, that it could have been a whale shark or it could have been a sperm whale. They were not quite as big as other whales, but it could have been just what it says, a large fish. And so the very fact that he stays alive, it's a miracle. That's what Calvin was saying. This is a, this is a huge miracle. <laughs> you know, that this man is actually being kept alive. I, I said last week that I, I just, using my imagination a little bit, I can't, Im I can't imagine that that was a very comfortable time. Oh, it's like, Lord, isn't two minutes enough? <laughs> you know, <laughs> get me out of here. Um, actually, he was, I think Jonah was grateful for the fish because the, the idea you get when you read this chapter closely is that he was perishing. And then the fish, in a sense, rescues him. And um, so he's finds a place of safety in that fish, but it could not have been comfortable. I don't know the digestive system of a fish. I've never actually studied that. When I was in biology class, we dissected frogs so we could, I, I won't see what we did. But anyways, um, <laughs> so we, we would see what the, their innards look like. Okay, let me just say it that way. And, uh, but we never learned about the digestion of a fish, but um, it could not have been a pleasant experience. Um, temperatures, um, darkness, um, who knows, the smells, um, whatever. And that's a long time. And so he's experiencing a very negative uh, experience. Positive in one sense, negative on the other. But he nearly dies before the fish even catches hold of him. He says, in my distress, um, I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. In the Old Testament, the word Sheol is used sometimes for the realm of the dead, sometimes for the grave. But it becomes very symbolic for a dire situation. He really saw himself, and we'll read more, he saw himself as a dying man. So Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. That's what verse 1 started out by saying. He prayed to the Lord, his God. Isn't that interesting? Even in his rebellion, even at the point of dying, Yahweh is still his God. You see, that's God's covenant faithfulness to this prophet. Yahweh is his God. And he recognized that. And he prays to him from the belly 
of the fish. Saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried and you heard my voice. Notice how Jonah says that out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. I cried, or I cried out to the Lord. This is a clear picture, if you will, description of absolute helplessness. This is absolute helplessness. There's nothing Jonah can do to rescue himself at all in any way. It's also Jonah's acknowledgement of his own powerlessness. The fact that he realizes, I've only got one way of escape. I've only got one hope. And that's God. That's, that's the situation he is in. God is my only hope. My only hope. If he doesn't save me, I'm dead. Period. I'm done. I believe at this point he sees that God is, will rescue him in the sense that the fish had already come <laughs> and swallowed him. But verse 3, he says, You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Job, excuse me, Jonah recognizes God's, that God is in control. He recognizes that control when he says, you cast me into the deep. It was the mariners who picked him up, the other men on the ship that picked him up and threw him in. They didn't want to do that. When Jonah suggested to them, throw me in the water and then the, the, the sea will be calm, they, they started rowing like crazy to get to shore. They, they, wanted to, they wanted to save his life, which is one of those ironies and contrasts that we see in the book of Jonah. When you get to chapter 4 and he's whining and angry because God rescued the Ninevites. See, Jonah didn't want to save the, the Gentiles, yet here the Gentiles wanted to save Jonah. Isn't that, it's one of those ironies that we see in this book. Very interesting. But Jonah does recognize the sovereignty and the control of God. He's saying, God, you threw me into the water. You know, I, I, I made that choice. I'd rather go there and drown and, you know, save their lives. But, you know, um, I, I don't want to go to Nineveh I'm in a big way. Just throw me into the water. And then he says, all your waves and your billows passed over me. He's saying this is a recognition of God's judgment and chastening. The rough experience that he's having in the water. All of your waves and your billows are over me. It's, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm in this water and I'm dying, I'm perishing. This is, he's recognizing God's judgment. It's God's judgment, but when God judges his own people, those who belong to him in covenant, it's a chastening in order to turn them back. He chastens. And Paul the Apostle makes that clear even in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in the context of the Corinthians abusing the Lord's Supper. He says, if you would judge yourselves, God would not judge you. He says, many of you are sick and some are even dying. But he says, if you would judge yourselves, examine yourselves, God would not judge you. But if he judges you, he's chastening you. You see, God's judgment toward his people is not one of condemnation to wrath. It's one of chastening to turn you around. Jonah recognizes that he's under the chastening of the Lord in what's happening. And this ocean, these waves, and these billows, as hard as they are, as painful as it is, they are God's. God is still there, just like Psalm 139. Where can I flee from your presence? You, you've made everything, you own everything. Do you see how this book portrays God? as not only the creator but the sustainer and he's not you know deism says yeah God is you know he, he created everything way at the beginning it's kind of like winding up what we use that illustration now like winding up a clock and then letting it run on its own that's deism but 
the Bible does not teach that at all. The Bible is very clear that God is very personal and he's imminent. He's, he's present everywhere. And we have to understand true biblical Christianity teaches that God isn't just letting the laws of nature happen. He controls the laws of nature. He controls every breath that we take. He didn't just get our, our heart going for us and say, okay, I'll let the natural laws of biology do their thing. Though they do, he works through those things. Those are his means. But he's the one who upholds all, thing, all things, holds it all together. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds it all. The scientists don't know what what holds atoms together at least they didn't 10 years ago I don't know if that's changed at all they often but they've been puzzled what is it that holds atoms together <laughs> that the whole universe doesn't just go wham you know and just explode another big bang I guess um, I, Jesus Christ does and we need to recognize that and Jonah is saying these waves these are not just ocean waves these are your ocean waves your waves, your billows are falling over me, Lord. You're in control. They belong to you. We need to see God that much in our lives and in the world around us. In verse 4, he says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. So, Jonah saying, I'm driven from your sight. Well, actually, Jonah, remember, you ran away from his presence. <laughs> but I think what he's recognizing here, this is just another statement of the fact that he's away from the favor of the Lord. He feels that he's dying and he's away from the favor of the Lord. But he says, I shall again look upon your holy temple. Otherwise, I believe that because he's the Lord delivers, that I will again be in the presence of God's people in the temple worshiping God. For those who have come to the Psalms studies, we've seen that that's very important throughout the book of Psalms to the psalmist to celebrate their testimony, to celebrate what God has done to deliver them in the temple among God's people. They wanted to go, go to the temple to celebrate with God's people the great deliverances of God. That, I believe, is what Jonah is saying here. I will once again be at that temple and I will proclaim his praises and celebrate with the people of God. I will be in his presence. Even though I feel as though I've been driven from his sight, <laughs> I will yet again worship toward his temple. I will look toward his holy temple. We need to remind ourselves in those times in our lives, whether it's deep darkness or just bad, a bad day, because we, we have struggles in our lives. We have days when God might feel like he's a million miles away. And uh, like C.S. Lewis said, it's like pounding on a door over and over wondering, you know, if anybody hears you, wondering if there was ever really anybody there to begin with. That was his experience in the grief over the death of his wife. Was there really anybody there to begin with? Jonah is saying in those times, we are confident in who God is. I will upon your holy temple. This isn't forever. My darkness will come to an end. This distance I sense from God will end. I will once again taste his beautiful presence. Praise God. So, we note that within Jonah is that desire to be in his presence. That's a, that's a good and a godly thing. God's people who are born again and redeemed, born of the Spirit of God, have a desire for his presence presence and for his people. In verse 5 it says the waters closed in over me to take my life. 
The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around about my head. Verse 6, at the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. In verses 5 to 7, Jonah records how close to death he really was. He is dying. That's what he means in verse 7 when he says, My life was fainting away. There have been some scholars who said he really literally did die. In fact, I, I had this one study Bible. I still do, actually, but haven't used it in quite a while. But this, this guy said, yeah, Jonah died, and that's why he's a true type of Christ. Well, I don't think he necessarily died, and nor does he to be a type of Christ. He didn't have to die in order to be the true type. His experience is what Jesus is alluding to. The fact that he was in the belly, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So um, I don't believe he really died, but he's, he's close and he knows it. He's dying. My, my life is fading away. It's fainting away. And um, I'm going down to the roots of the mountains. The, I, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. The symbolic of death. You know, I'm going to be barred from the presence of the Lord. I'm going to die. And so this is absolute. People, you can't get more helpless than that. Interesting that, I think it's interesting that God allowed Jonah to come that close to being gone, to being dead. It talks about the roots of the mountains. I just, I just found this um, interesting in reading some explanation about this. Some um, translations will say the foundations of the mountains are in the sea, and you have, you know, you have some you know higher critical uh, liberal scholars mocking that whole idea. And of course, I think if we removed all the seas, you would see mountains. But um, but what's interesting is if to the north of Israel, Mount Carmel. It's uh, for the people, what they would have seen and experienced at looking at that mountain range, they would have seen these high mountains gradually descend and continue down into the Mediterranean. So you can see how somebody would feel that the foundation of the mountains are in the sea. That was their visual. They saw the mountains continue and they went down into the sea. So I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting little um, topographical kind of... Uh, kind of experience for those people. But for us, what we're seeing here is his absolute helplessness and weakness. When he mentions in verse 7 the holy temple, this time he's not just talking about Jerusalem. And this is important for us to see. This is a reference to the heavenly temple. Now, when he says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. He's now recognizing the God of heaven who is over all. It's a huge confession of God's supremacy. And you can see what's going on in his heart and what would have been the message to the people of Israel. God's supremacy over all nations. He is the God, not just of the temple in Jerusalem, but he's the God of heaven who reigns supreme over all. So that's the experience of Jonah as he's having his near-death experience. He reigns from heaven itself. The message for the Jewish people should have been, would have been, that God is the Lord of all nations, not just Israel. So the people of Israel are to be a light to the nations. Now, keep this in mind too. This is part of the picture. God did choose a Hebrew prophet to bring that light to a Gentile nation. 
You see, God chose the nation of Israel. God has a way of salvation and a people through whom he proclaims that salvation so that people can find salvation through what he has revealed as the way to be saved. So yes, he is supreme over all. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He reigns in heaven over all the nations. But it's a Hebrew that he calls a prophet who knows the scriptures, who knows the living God to go to Nineveh and to preach. So we need to keep that picture in mind as well. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you and I today have the news of the gospel. And God sends us out to be light to others as well. In verse 8, he says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. He may have had in mind the Gentiles who were on that ship as he saw them all crying out to their own deities. But... Um, my sense is that this has a message for the people of Israel who had gone into idolatry. The message would be, if you are worshiping idols, if you've gone into Baal worship and your Asherah poles and all that other idolatry, if, if that's what, what you're doing, then you are forsaking God's steadfast love the blessings he wants to bring you in a relationship with himself you're pushing him aside you're distancing yourself from the experience of his tremendous grace and his steadfast love you cannot be blessed by worshiping idols the idols couldn't save the mariners only Yahweh could save the mariners only he could calm the sea the idols can't do it Do you see what a powerful message this becomes to a nation that has gone into idolatry and Jonah is saying if you go into idolatry you are forsaking your covenant commitment to Almighty God the New American Standard says you you forsake your faithfulness, putting an emphasis on the fact that you are forsaking your part of the covenant and therefore God cannot bless you like he would like to bless you. Idolatry and worship of Yahweh do not go together ever. Ever. In um, one point about idolatry, people think that idolatry involves like just like worship. I've heard people make statements that, um, you know, like, well, I, I don't really, I don't really worship, I just pray to. You know, like they'll say, I've prayed to a saint or something, and, uh, but I don't, I don't worship. Actually, idolatry is not, doesn't just entail worship. It entails trust. What is it you trust in? You see, are you trusting in the Lord? Or are you trusting in something else? What is it you trust in? And once you put your trust in reliance upon an object, like somehow having a particular object will bless me, you see a lot of that in like Buddhism and so on, you, you, you're putting your trust in some kind of an object. If I have that in my house, if I have it in my car, I'm safe. You're putting your trust in something. It's idolatry. Our trust is in the Lord alone, period. And in his, of course, the truth of his word that he reveals himself to us in. Verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Interesting that... Um, that Jonah is saying the same thing that the mariners had said after God rescued them and calmed the sea. They had vows and they sacrificed to the Lord as well. And like I said last week, they didn't do it on the ship. They probably waited till they got back to land. And we don't know if they were ever full proselytes or full converts to the Jewish faith, but we certainly know they embraced Yahweh as supreme. Praise God. So we see Jonah doing the same thing, but this is the pivotal verse of the entire book of Jonah. The, the main point, the, the theme of this book. Salvation belongs 
to the Lord. It belongs to him. He's sovereign, which means he can, ha he can have mercy on whomever he wills. He says in Romans chapter 9, you know, Paul quoting the Old Testament, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. You know, I will harden whom I will harden. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. God is sovereign. He's totally sovereign. All salvation belongs to the Lord. And here's the point I wanted to get to in this message. It needs, it, it becomes a great illustration for us of our own salvation. When we were born again and brought to faith in Jesus Christ, this, you know, one of the things that we don't always have in the New Testament like we have in the Old, the Old Testament is filled with these kind of pictures and experiences. Wonderful illustrations. And this becomes a great illustration, Jonah's experience of our salvation. Because we had each, like, the, like Isaiah 53 says, we had each gone our own way. Each one of us. We strayed like sheep. We wandered off. But Paul says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all, we've all hardened our hearts. We've all fled from God. Like from beginning with Adam in the garden, running away to hide from God, all throughout Scripture, people run from God. The Bible says we were hostile to God. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, dead in trespasses and sins. We cannot save ourselves. We have to come to a place of recognition that we are absolutely helpless. As helpless as Jonah was in the belly of that fish to save himself, to save his own life, and to rescue himself, that's how helpless we are. Now, it's interesting, Pete, what, did, what does Paul the Apostle mean when he says we're dead in trespasses and sins? What did the reformers mean when they talked about total depravity? You know, a radical corruption, a, a total corruption. It didn't mean that somehow the image of God within us was wiped out totally. It didn't mean that we lost all ability to make choices. It did not mean that. But it means that we are corrupted throughout our nature and therefore where salvation is concerned, we are as helpless as Jonah is in that fish. Helpless. And unless God saves, we're not saved. We are that helpless. And that's really what the message of repentance should be all about. And when we share the gospel with people, that's what we should share. You are helpless to save yourself. You are helpless. You may think you're a decent person, and maybe, maybe they are, but you know, people do wonderful and noble things all the time. Because the image of God hasn't been erased, it's been, it's been defaced but not erased. So there's, there's good that we see in people. Yeah, I see good in you. Yes, there's, there's good. But the point is, we are radically corrupted throughout our being as a result of sin. We all make sinful choices, and we are helpless to save ourselves. And God wants us to know that. If we could save ourselves, then why did the eternal Son of God take on human flesh and hang on that cross and suffer God's wrath for us in utter pain, agony, and weakness. If there was a way we could save ourselves, wouldn't God just shine the light, handed us a book, and say, that's enough? Just do this and I'll give you grace. I'll, I'll help you along on your road. God helps those who help themselves. So try to be good and that's, that's good. You, you've lived a good life. Welcome into my heaven. But you hear that all the time at funerals, don't you? Yeah, that, that was a good person. I know they're in heaven. But that's not the story of the gospel. It really, really isn't. The story of the gospel is that he comes to rescue. He speaks to the fish. He, he, we are helpless like Jonah was helpless. And then God, it, who controls all things, initiates salvation. 
I said here, I wrote down a note, it said, man contributes to the, his own sinful um, direction in life. You contribute a lot to your wandering. <laughs> you know, you're just not made to wander. We make choices and we wander. John Kelvin makes it very clear that that's the kind of choices we always will make. You know, we always make, and Martin Luther too, those are the choices we will always make. Sinful choices. Because of our nature. So, we contribute to our sinful direction in life. But only God has the power, the heart, the mind to save anybody. That's why we say our salvation is totally of the Lord. In a, among uh, Reformed uh, Reformation circles, there are the, the, the word that's used is monergism um, versus synergism. Mo moner comes from the word mono, meaning only. And then synergi synergism is, you know, the S-Y-N is the coming together, like synagogue, the gathering together of people, okay? And so, salvation is monergistic, which means God reaches down and he rescues us. We didn't help him save us. God didn't come to Jonah and say, let me give you a helping hand. I, what I will do is I will make you just a little bit stronger and you're going to rip that fish apart and you're going to sweat. No, God totally rescued this man. God has a way of, of demonstrating man's powerlessness. That's why I think Sarah and Abraham waited 25 years before she finally had a child. They, they, they came to the point of desperation. Maybe that's why Jonah was in that fish's belly for three days and three nights. To bring him to the total end. There would be no question of his absolute helplessness. And he himself says, I was fainting away. I was dying. I was, I was right at my last breath. God waited to that moment. And then God rescued Jonah so that it would be clear to Jonah and to everybody else throughout history, whoever read this, that God alone saved him. He did not rescue himself. So I need to close. But the main, the main point I want to bring out of this chapter is exactly that. This is the, one of the greatest illustrations in Scripture of man's helplessness and God's power to save. And it took a miracle to save him, didn't it? And the new birth, being born again, called out of darkness into God's marvelous light, is, is the work of God, and it's, a great, it's the greatest miracle. You know, we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we say, what a profound miracle that is. Well, it's because of that that we're born again out of our death, our sinful death. And made alive in Christ. That's part of the same miracle. It's as easy to get somebody saved as it is to raise them from the dead. <laughs> it's the same. If you can raise somebody from the dead, then you can save somebody. But you can't. Only God can. He just commissions us to preach his gospel message. To share. To let that light shine toward others. Do you see why the gospel is so important? And why the biggest attack on the Bible today is keeping the gospel out of the churches and preaching you know, psychology instead or good self-esteem or your best life now or any, any of that kind of stuff. Don't preach the gospel. Don't get to the heart of the gospel. Don't get to these truths because then people will be saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the message of Christ. That's how faith comes, through the message of Christ. So let's remember our helplessness in our salvation, that he alone saves. And let's also apply this in every situation in our lives 
We never grow beyond our need for him. We don't come to the point of becoming God's supermen and women. We don't become spiritual giants. We always live day by day at the foot of the cross in need of him to carry us through these difficult times in our lives. El Shaddai, the God who is strong and powerful, who will carry us through. He has saved and rescued us. He has brought us into that haven. But day by day, we rely on him to get us through the difficult times. Praise God. Good stuff in the book of Jonah, eh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, in our communion, we will celebrate exactly that. We will celebrate as we partake of the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus, these symbols of that, these instruments of God's grace that will strengthen us and strengthen us in our faith for the journey. Let's remember the one who has already shed his blood. You talk about a demonstration of our utter helplessness. When you take that bread in your hand and you take that cup in your hand, realize that that's not you, okay? It's something from outside of you. And Jesus Christ is not you. You're not God. You don't have some deity within you that is gonna you know, somehow come out through the right kind of meditation and save you. You're in need of a savior outside of yourself. And that's what we see as we celebrate the communion. If somebody would please.